Yeah, hi everyone, uh, I'm Matt Horton. I'm a data architect at CDL. Um, CDL, we're a fintech, we're based in the UK. Uh, we're a market leader in the highly competitive retail insurance sector, and we offer software solutions covering policy admin, real-time pricing, quote manipulation, and data and analytics. Uh, I'm an AWS community builder, and I'm one of the 50 global click luminaries. So today, I'm gonna to talk about how our data engineering teams completed a large-scale database migration to AWS. So I joined uh, CDL in 2014 as an Oracle DBA. Um, we operated from two data centers in Stockport, and they cost about four million pounds each to build. Customers of ours demand high availability for all of our solutions. So in addition to the two data centers, we built out a robust database architecture running Oracle. We had Oracle real application clusters, so within a single data center, there was three nodes. If a database failed, it would move on to one of the two additional nodes. If all nodes in the cluster failed, um, we were running data guard, so that was okay. We would fail over to the, another data center, which had the exact same three node cluster set up. The database software ran on Oracle Enterprise Linux, and we had case splice that allowed us to patch the operating system with minimal downtime. We ran Oracle VM on top of Oracle hardware with CPU pinning to meet license requirements. Uh, we had NetApp storage um, that gave us mirroring of back backups over two dedicated links between the two data centers. And we had monitoring provided by Oracle Enterprise Manager, OEM, and also Rundeck to help us schedule and manage all of our backup scripts. As you can see, we were all in on Oracle. We had a team of Oracle DBAs and we also ran our middleware on WebLogic. There was a lot to look after, but it all worked, and we were rightly proud of the high availability we delivered to customers. But when our licensing deal came up for renewal, the price changed, and it quickly became apparent that we needed to move to another database to have a cost-optimized solution. At this point in late 2015, we'd also started looking into the cloud with AWS specifically, and we were already De um, developing a brand new product solely on AWS. But we still saw a need at that point for on-premise deployments. So some of our DBAs started to look at building out a new Postgres architecture that would work both in the cloud and on-premise. We spent about six months trying to develop the on-premise architecture you see here. We've got Postgres running on VMware, NetApp storage again, we were using Petroni for failover, which required a distributed configuration store, so we stood up ETCD. NetApp didn't have a driver for Postgres yet, so in order to do database snapshots, we had to write scripts. We actually got this stack built, but then one day we did an upgrade on Petroni, and it failed. Luckily, it was still in a development environment because we got really stuck, and it took us a while to bring it all back. At this point, CDL had announced that we were cloud first, but not yet cloud only. However, we took the decision not to build out a database service on premise. It was gonna to be too much work, and we hadn't actually got to work on the business problem that we'd been given, which was migrate this application from Oracle to Postgres. We were really busy building out pl plumbing that we thought we needed to work on that business problem. It would be easy to write off the on-premise work on Postgres as a total failure, but it really wasn't. The team at this point still had Oracle DBA job titles, so learning Postgres from the ground up taught us a lot and helped us later on. But moving to RDS removed a lot of the fear that the team had for all the plumbing work that was needed and the potential failures that we might have to deal with in a production environment. We were still learning, but that learning shifted away from infrastructure we started to look at PG stat statements, CloudWatch logs, PG Badger, and learning the differences between the two SQL dialects, Postgres and Oracle. So I'll walk through some of the typical steps you would need for any kind of database migration to the cloud. First step is to point something called the schema conversion tool, SCT. So this is a tool that AWS provide. It will give you a report on what you're gonna to need to change. It's really a one-time thing at the start of your migration journey, and you're gonna get some scripts out the back. Secondly, once you've got your RDS instance stood up, you need to get your data over there. 
And to do this, you should use a CDC tool, Change Data Capture. And what this will do is it will transfer your tables, your primary keys, and your data over to your RDS instance. Then you would look to add the views, functions, and indexes. If you're moving from Oracle to Postgres, you're going to have to convert any PLSQL um, to PG PLSQL. And depending on how um, ingrained you are in Oracle, you may have lots of work around removing Oracle-specific features and functions. Some could be in your database code, but some could be in your application code as well. We found an Oracle feature in our business intelligence software, for example, that had no equivalent in Postgres. More on that later. So we've changed data capture, CDC. Transactions are read from the source online transaction processing database and are sent via click replicate here, which is our CDC tool of choice into AWS. The transactions are applied to an Amazon RDS instance. There are lots of other CDL, CDC tools available. Amazon, for example, offer the database migration service, DMS, but we were using Click as we already had the experience with it, and it made sense for us not to have to learn another thing. So to deploy this kind of Click Replicate solution, we need a source database, we need Click Replicate itself, and we also had Click Enterprise Manager, and we need a target database. And these components all need to be able to communicate each other with each other, so we spin up the infrastructure as code, and we apply appropriate AWS security groups. We also need to have click replicate tasks defined to process the data between source and target. And we used APIs available through Click Enterprise Manager to automate the registration of replicate servers and the creation of task definitions. So this is a demo that I recorded a couple of years ago. Um, it's using Terraform here, and we're going to deploy all the components required to take data from an existing source database, Oracle in this instance, and replicate that to another source. I'm actually using S3 in this example. So the Terraform here is creating all the EC2 instances required to run the Click software, and then it will add the source and target endpoint configuration, and finally create the task uh, definitions that take the data from the source database and load it to S3. So here you can see I'm logging into the management tool, which is Enterprise Manager, and you'll see the infrastructure code there. In, re in, in real life, that would take about five minutes to run, so this video is, is sped up slightly. But you can see servers and tasks being created automatically through infrastructure as code, and we've got a customer table, and we're going to dump all of that data to S3. So there it's it's, it's dumped all the data to a JSON file in that case. So that's CDC in action. That's a full load, but CDC tools generally offer full load plus change data capture, so you just replay the, um, the transactions as they're happening in flight, and it can be on a production database that's actually being used. So another great use case for CDC um, is to move towards an event-driven architecture. So tools like Click Replicate can actually support multiple targets, even when using a large relational database as their source. So with a streaming platform like Kafka, we can have both near instantaneous reporting and also move to modern event-driven architectures that respond to events on the stream. So with this kind of architecture pattern, you can actually start to build out new functionality of your solution using loosely coupled software components, such as serverless lambda functions, consuming and processing the events from a stream. And building additional functionality like this using an event-driven architecture simplifies your horizontal scalability and is going, to make more, is going to make things more resilient to failure. So in addition to using um, Click Enterprise Manager for deployments, we're also using it to track our migrations. We like that the REST API has been expanded over time. We've been using this to gather all the metrics from our replicate servers and our tasks, and we're feeding those into Elastic Stack. This is one of our Kibana dashboards. So here we can visualize the key replicate metrics we've collected by that REST API. We can see the maximum latency by task, both current and over a period of time. And we can also see in the gauge what the overall latency is across our replicate estate. Things like CPU and memory utilization are shown by both server and task. And finally, we can see if the state of each task is good or bad. So with these steps for migrations defined and tested, 
we knew that we were going to have to repeat this a lot. We needed to automate. So we created change data capture tasks in the Clip Replicate console. We exported those definitions of JSON. And we used that JSON template and made each migration config driven. Finding and replacing specific client items like host name and schema names. The automated migration process could then have an input file of variables and the process built all the scripts with the correct customer specific values. So at the start of the migration, we locked the Oracle database accounts and then if we needed to roll back, it was just a case of unlocking the Oracle database again and switching the application endpoint back to Oracle. By deploying all of this infrastructure as code, you get the benefits of reducing risk. Automation removes that human element. A lot of these migrations are done out of hours. I'm not my best doing manual deployments late at night. I'm gonna make mistakes. Consistency, you can make the same thing every time. And also speed of deployment, which we'll come on to later. You can roll out changes quickly through multiple environments for multiple customers without having to scale up your team. So the main application that we migrated to AWS as part of our database migration was CDL's insurance retail solution called Strata. So Strata supports insurance providers to bring products to market using a multi-channel strategy and all the data is in a single database. Its components enable the sale and administration of policies, including telematics-based insurance, and we're able to sell these things via the web, price comparison sites, contact center, mobile, and voice devices. It's used by some of the UK's largest personal alliance providers, and the system is generating millions of transactions every day, and these are spread throughout a highly relational data model. Which brings me on to tuning. After the initial migration in the development environment, we started up the application. It failed. There were lots of connection, initiation, SQL statements being run, trying to select from the dual table. This is an Oracle only thing. So we created a dual table in Postgres to get up and running and then remove the code in the application later. On our second attempt, the application started, but was way too slow. We had developers saying, this screen used to take three seconds, now it's taking two minutes, or it's even timing out. We saw a horrendous number of joins in the SQL, and it was also bringing back lots of unnecessary columns. At this point, we changed about 10, 10 different views to get the application usable. So some of the things that we did to tune further. Um, the join collapse limit parameter, this influences query planner um, to rewrite explicit join constructs. Um, smaller values reduce the planning time, but might yield inferior query plans. Because the query planner doesn't always choose the optima, optimal join order, advanced users can elect to set this variable. Alongside this, the from collapse limit uh, parameter, um, again, the planner will merge subqueries into upper queries if the resulting from list would have no more than the value set in this uh, parameter. Smaller value, values, again, reduce planning time, but might yield inferior query plans. Workmem. This parameter sets the maximum amount of memory that can be used by a query operation such as a sort before writing temporary, uh, temporary um, data to disk files. The default value is four megabytes, so this was too low for us. So note that for complex queries, um, several sort or hash operations might be running in parallel, and each operation generally will be allowed to use as much memory as this value specifies before it starts to write uh, data to temporary files. So sort operations are used for order by, distinct, merge joins, and hash tables are used in hash joins, hash-based aggregations, result cache nodes, and hash-based processing of in subqueries. Another parameter that we, um, we set was the PG stat statements, uh, or enabled this particular module, in fact, um, which provides a means for tracking planning and execution statistics for all SQL statements executed by a server. Um, the module must be loaded um, by adding PG stat statements to your shared preload libraries in your Postgres comp file um, because it requires additional shared memory. In RDS, this is just a parameter group change. The statistics gathered by this module are made available via a view named PG stat statements, and the view contains a one row for each distinct combination of database ID, user ID, and query ID. 
We also set a PG uh, pre-war module because um, this provides a convenient way for loading relational data into either the operating system buffer cache or the Postgres buffer cache. So pre-warming can be performed manually using a PG pre-warm function or it can be performed automatically by including PG pre-warm in your shared preload libraries, which is what we did. Next, we turned on logging for any, any statement that was taking more than one second, and we sent all of those logs to Elasticsearch. At this point, we ended up tuning about 60 different views, adding them to the dev database for testing, putting them into the code base later on. We still have this proactive dashboard um, in Kibada, and if we get rubbish SQL, we see it in a non-prod environment before it affects customers. We also tried out lots of different tools as well. So having Postgres logs shipped to AWS CloudWatch logs. Um, we also use Amazon RDS Performance Insights, which is a database performance tuning and monitoring feature to help, help you quickly assess the load on your database. And also something called PG Badger, which is a Postgres log analysis report tool. But what we found that happened organizationally was much more interesting than this. The DBAs were now using RDS, and they were not installing database software, so had more time to work directly with the development teams on making the software better. We suddenly found we were doing DevOps. DBAs sat next to developers working together and not having to raise tickets. So I touched there on the DBAs not installing database software, and RDS is also handling patching and backups. So that raises the question, what do the DBAs do now? Well, in our case, the answer is automation on top of the automation. They build and maintain Terraform for our infrastructure as code. They build and maintain pipelines. They use Atlantis um, so that they can roll out to new environments through config. They're also able to move the database technology on much faster than they ever did before. For example, on-premise, historically, our Oracle 11G to 12C up upgrade took us a year to complete. Now we have RDS and the automation I've spoken about. We can move between major versions of Postgres in four weeks. We're actually throttling this ourselves. We could do the entire database estate in one night if we needed to. We can roll out new clients faster. We can roll out critical bug fixes faster. We can go now as fast as the business wants. The technology and the team is no longer the bottleneck. It's actually risk appetite from CDL or our customers. The DBAs think about CDL growing. What happens when we get to 1,000 databases, 2,000 databases, et cetera? Well, it's not a problem because we can scale to deliver that company strategy. The automation doesn't just happen, but when you're not installing database software, patching it and backing it up, you now have time to do it. So automation has also improved the developer experience. Um, the DBA team have enhanced um, some self-service functionality that we had that they use uh, Rundeck um, to build out. Developers often require clones of production databases to work through potential bugs or test at production volumes. And through the self-service portal, developers can now create their own database clones. An automated process um, does a point in time recovery of a production database to a new RDS instance. We downsize the instance class and make it a single AZ to save us costs. And we run a masking process, and this protects sensitive data. And finally, temporary credentials are provided to the developer. So on premise, for large clients, this process took about 18 hours. But the DBAs have optimized this by creating and masking clones for each production database every weekend. And then using RDS snapshots, they take a snapshot and make it available to the non-production AWS accounts. Now using the self-service process, which uses PG's transport, they import the data into a developer's instance. So the typical 18-hour process now takes 18 minutes. An 8-terabyte database is ready within 30 minutes. Developers also want to be able to check configuration data in live client environments, so we've made pre-approved queries available to be executed against production databases via the self-service portal. And in the event of a customer-facing incident, DBAs would often get asked to run a health check to check the databases to help triage. This has all been scripted and made available directly, in the, directly to the service center for them to run without having to wait for a DBA. Customer testing has also been improved as cloning from production to training in UAT environments is all automated 
and can be requested through the self-service portal. DBAs are no longer needed to export and import. The database has become a product built on top of RDS, but with value specific to our needs added by the DBAs. The DBAs have become data engineers. They've actually changed their job titles. They write code, they create automated processes, they're building a product. They're also learning new skills as the move to data engineer has allowed them to work on more types of projects using technologies like EMR, Python, Spark, Hoodie, Athena, and QuickSight, to name just a few. So to support seamless integration and deployment of applications with RDS, AWS established something called the Service Ready Program. And this helps customers like CDL identify products um, that can be integrated in the best way with RDS so they can spend less time evaluating new tools and more time uh, scaling the use of their products. So ED, um, CDL have achieved two uh, um, Amazon Relational Database Service Ready designations, and we're actually launch partners for both of these. Um, so to achieve an RDS Ready designation, we have to demonstrate that our products followed AWS architecture, security, and reliability best practices um, in order to integrate with RDS. If anybody's ever worked with um, the well-architected tool, it's a very similar idea to that um, process that you follow, but obviously the focus is solely on your integration with RDS. So I'll go through some of the key criteria that's in the Service Ready program that helped us use, uh, make best use of RDS. The first one's connection pooling. So RDS Ready states that if the application frequently opens and closes many short-lived connections, that it should use connection pooling. And applications that keep a large number of connections open for longer periods of time without much activity should also use connection pooling. Our application is a Java EE application, and it runs within a Pyara application server. Uh, the components of the application utilize a number of database connection pools. There's three main JDBC connection pools. The application is actually deployed in a um, Docker container, and the Docker file has these environment variables that specify the JDBC connection pool sizes. There's also an environment variable that um, applies to statement and connection leak detection. So this is a feature that allows you to set specific timeouts so that SQL statements or JDBC connections haven't been closed by an application, potentially leading to a memory leak. They can be logged and or closed. RDS Ready states that database credentials must never be logged. So there's a few ways to achieve this. Most of the time we're using systems man manager parameter st store with secure strings. Um, application deployments can then make a call to the API to retrieve the credentials that their IAM role allows them to access. This, in, this avoids embedding secrets in files, basically. Um, AWS Secret Manager also integrates with RDS and their third-party tools like HashiCorp Vault that offer very similar functionality. Actually, the AWS um, Foundational Technical Review, which is part of the Well-Architected Framework, also states that since July this year, temporary credentials should be used whenever possible. So RDS does actually allow for this through the use of their IAM authentication feature. So with IAM authentication, tokens are used, and each token has a lifetime of about 15 minutes. Just a quick point to note, because um, we've recently been doing a SQL Server migration, IAM authentication isn't supported, unfortunately, yet with SQL Server, but all the other flavors are. Um, so... For business applications where data encryption is a requirement for security and compliance, which today is, is most things, <laughs> the product must support encryption in order at, at, at rest and in transit in order for you to get RDS ready status. That certainly applies to our workloads. So encryption at rest is enabled um, and we have a customized parameter group that's defined in our Terraform code that forces connections to use SSL. So you can see the, um, the uh, parameter there rds.force SSL set to one. Um, the other parameters to highlight on here, they're not to do with encryption, but they refer to things that I mentioned in the tuning section, the PG stat statements and the log minimum duration. Um, they're all used uh, as part of the proactive tuning that I mentioned earlier. So in terms of database failure and performance testing, RDS Ready has some standards around that. So products that connect 
directly to an RDS database must continue to function in the event of a database failover. And any AWS partners pre-release performance testing um, must include testing against Amazon RDS instances specifically. So how we handle this is our RDS instances are created using Terraform infrastructure as code. As part of that, we create a route 53 entry and the TTO is set quite low, set to five. Um, we test database failover as part of our performance testing. Um, so for performance testing and failover, we use a set of performance tests that are built using Gatling, which is an open source load and performance testing framework. We um, have a private car insurance quote simulation that's executed. This is run for about 30 minutes. And at the 10 minute point, we force RDS to fail over from the primary to the standby instance. At this point, generally we see loss of connectivity between RDS during the failover, which took, takes about three minutes in our case. But after that, the application just recovers uh, connectivity to RDS and it continues to function as expected. During our tests of failover, uh, there were about 40 requests that were affected by the lack of an available RDS instance. So earlier, I mentioned that during the standard migration steps that we found uh, an Oracle feature in our business intelligence solution that had no equivalent in Postgres. And this was something called fast refresh materialized views. So our business intelligence solution called Kingfisher takes about 700 database tables that have been optimized for online transaction processing and denormalizes the data into about 100 materialized views that are optimized for analytics workloads. Because Postgres doesn't natively support um, fast refresh, we had to build this capability from scratch. There was um, another one out there, which it looks like it's due to go into actually Postgres 15, but it doesn't support things like outer joins, uh, and our, the capability that we built does, because we, we had a lot of um, outer joins in our analytics workloads. To help us build this capability from scratch though, we reached out to the AWS Database Freedom team to deliver the project. We've actually open sourced it now and we continue to maintain it. Um, the principal data engineer on our database migration pro project I'm talking about today is Tony Mullen. He's written a guest blog for AWS all about this, which is well worth a read if you run Postgres databases. Um, he must have good, done a good job because he now works for AWS as a senior SA specializing in RDS. Um, if you scan the QR code, uh, you'll find links both to the GitHub repo um, for our open source project and for Tony's blog post. So this is the architecture for our fast refresh views in Postgres. So using database triggers, we capture transactions uh, taking place from the underlying tables that make up our materialized views. These transactions are stored in additional tables shown here as the materialized view logs. When we want to update the materialized view, instead of running the SQL to completely refresh all of the data, we just bring it up to date by processing only the changes that have taken place since the last refresh. And by using this fast refresh technology, we can achieve a latency of as low as about one minute from the original transaction taking place. So using our open source project, I walk through the process of creating and refreshing materialized views once the fast refresh module has been installed into the database and the instructions to do that are all on GitHub. So the first step is to create the materialized view logs for the source tables that make up the view, the materialized view that you're going to create. The materialized view logs are used to track the changes, as I mentioned, to the source tables. So this is the code that we create. Uh, we've got uh, six tables that basically will go into making up a view. The second step is to actually create the materialized view. So the procedure here is called create materialized view. It's called passing in the name of the view that you're creating. The big bit in the middle is the SQL statement used to create the view. So basically it's joining tables one through six to, together there. We specify the owner of the view and we set the fast refresh parameter to true. So this will store the result of that SQL query as a new materialized view. Next, we make changes to the source table um, that make up um, the, uh, sorry, the changes to the source table that make up the view that we've created. So here you can see an update being done against table test one. And then we call the refresh materialized view procedure. So this is gonna basically bring our view that we've created up to date with, those, with that change that's been made to table test one. 
So typically we schedule these to run every 15 minutes. We use something like PG Cron or we use Run Deck, but any schedule of your choice is, is fine. So here's a demo of the process. So we've got tables, test one through six. A few bits of data in each of them. And we've already created a materialized view on these six tables, basically just joins them all together using IDs. So we're going to update table test one. So you can see a bit blurry from here, but basically the last value there has changed from goodbye to reinvent. And if we go to the materialized view that joins all those tables together, the value still says goodbye. So we're going to run the refresh procedure. You go back to the table. And the value should change from goodbye to reinvent. So basically what it's done behind the scenes, rather than completely rebuilding that whole table, is just change that one row. That's what fast refresh is all about. So one final tip to close. AWS obviously gives you some awesome building blocks, but for our migrations to succeed at scale, we needed to, the help of all of our teams. Engineers, of course, to do all the things that I've spoken about today, but we also required our legal, compliance, project management, service management, and our customer teams to make our flagship product cloud only. We've recognized every migration by hanging a cloud at our campus. And after the last migration completed, we held a cloud celebration day. Over 200 CDL people came to our campus for food, drinks, and fun. We recognized key individuals, but everybody at CDL was given an extra day holiday. Thanks very much for listening. Awesome. Thank you, Matt. Uh, right, let's have some questions. Hello, Tony. <laughs> Questions? Ah, one from the front of the room makes it very easy. Um, hello. Uh, you had in your diagram where you had opportunity sort of streamifying data and sending it to Kafka. Yeah. Uh, was that a sort of, do you still do that? And is that, a, if you did, is that a halfway house towards going to a completely streaming architecture where the databases move to the right of it? It's a great question. Uh, so, uh, still got to get through our architecture board, but yes, <laughs> that is what I'm proposing. Um, yeah, basically, um, I think it's Ben speaking today, Ben Ellaby. So he talks about yes. minimal viable migrations. So he, he mentions that kind of pattern to basically um, use CDC to, to start sending events out there, and then you start to build really cheap, cheaply ser proper serverless architectures without having to do kind of a big migration like that. Because we've done a big migration, but we're still not like event driven. So yeah, the answer is yes. Um, we'll use the same click replicate architecture, but start to consume that using serverless technology. Cool. Next question, please. Okie doke. Uh, when using tools like Click or DMS to transfer large volumes of data from like Oracle to Postgres, mm -hmm. did you find that was straightforward or did it give a whole bunch of errors because of schema incompatibilities that you needed to battle through? Um, it depends on the application. Um, so certain applications just went through nice and clean. That one, um, as you can see, we had, well, one major problem that the functionality just didn't exist at all. So we had to literally code it. Um, we did. Over the years, we have tried a number of CDC tools. Like I say, our, our preference is Click. Um, works with lots of um, source databases. Um, and we have found that to be really, really good. And we don't get too many issues with it. Um, but we have tried later versions of DMS. And we probably say it's broadly compatible. Um, again, so yeah, those are probably our two favorite uh, CDC tools give us uh, the fewest problems. OK, good stuff. Next question. We've got a couple of minutes. Fabulous on your timing, Matt. <laughs> really good. <laughs> Anyone else? <laughs> there 
There you go, Mike. Cheers, thanks for the talk. Okay. Um, the uh, login via IAM, um, yeah. so we're using the DB user logins. Um, have you found that that's caused any sort of slowdown in sort of production environments at all? I, the last time I used that was uh, like five years ago, so maybe okay. they've improved it. But I remember at the time we were noticing, uh, we were running a web application where I guess the, the connection probably wasn't maybe great, but every time it needed to get a connection, there was like a second of latency sort of added doing the IAM, so we reverted back to using standard credentials. Uh, have, have you ha encountered any issues with that or, or measured it at all? Yeah, so um, one of the things you can do there is if uh, you can stick RDS proxy in front of it, so that's what AWS would recommend, obviously, to keep those kind of connections alive. And really, the idea um, around the connection pooling is really an important one there. So if you've got connections that are basically shared and on all the time, probably use something like RDS proxy. Cool. And in terms of the RDS proxy setup, like, is the is the setup of that proxy initially something that seems to be a significant amount of work, or is it incredibly trivial in terms of installing that between the two layers? Um, so we don't we don't use RDS proxy it's, uh, itself at CDL in production. So um, probably a little out of my depth here. Um, in terms of the setup, it's just like any other AWS service that it, they do make it relatively easy to use. I would say one of the reasons we've not adopted it is that there's an extra cost there, and because of the um, the kind of connection pooling that we get from Pyara, which is our application server, we didn't need an an additional connection pooling service. Cool. That's great. Thanks very much. Thanks. OK. I think I can hear the room next door as, uh, as finished. So um, it is break time. Um, but first, let's give Matt, thank you very much, a massive round of applause. <laughs>